The Ukraine is weak. It's feeble. I think it's time to put the hurt on the Ukraine. I come from Ukraine. You not say Ukraine weak. Yeah, well, we're playing a game here, pal. Ukraine is game to you. How about I take your little borders from ah! On February 24th of 2022, Russia invaded Ukraine to the shock and disgust of onlookers worldwide. External observers, both politicians and the general public, were quick to denounce Russia's actions, myself included, but things quickly began to escalate from the denouncement to calls for the West to enter into the conflict. Pew polling from March was indicative that about a third of Americans were willing to go to war with Russia over Ukraine, even if that war would result in the use of nuclear weapons. An unknown number of volunteers from the US, UK, and other Western countries were seemingly unwilling to wait for their governments to take action about the Russians, booking tickets for themselves and flying to Ukraine to support the nation's military, only for many to quickly realize that real war is just a little bit different from Call of Duty. They're trying to send us to Kiev with no weapons, no kit, no plates. The people who are lucky enough to get weapons are only getting magazines with like 10 rounds, okay? When they wanted to send us to Kiev, we said no. Our whole group, a bunch of Americans, Canadians, British. So they told us we had to get the out or they were gonna shoot us in the back. But how did we get to that point? Listening to the likes of Vice President Kamala Harris's attempt to describe the situation surely wouldn't help clarify why any of these events occurred. So Ukraine is a country in Europe. It exists next to another country called Russia. Russia is a bigger country. Russia is a powerful country. Russia decided to invade a smaller country called Ukraine. Why don't you explain this to me like I'm five? So today, let's take a close look at the last hundred years of Ukrainian history to try and understand why Russia invaded Ukraine and the role that the United States and other Western nations may have played in the many events that precipitated the conflict. But first, and because this is going to be quite a long video, let's start by grabbing ourselves some snacks. And when I'm looking for a snack to munch on while I'm watching long YouTube videos, I also look for something that won't completely disturb my diet, which is why I love this video's sponsor, Magic Spoon. Magic Spoon offers a line of cereals that bring the nostalgia of youth into your adult life all guilt-free, with each serving containing zero sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and only four net grams of carbs, and about 140 calories. If, like me, you follow a low-carb diet but love carbs, and woo, do I love carbs, not so much candy or sweets, but fresh-baked bread is something I probably love way more than I should. Then Magic Spoon is a great breakfast choice that won't break keto or disrupt your diet, but does give you the satisfaction of not just enjoying something that feels carby and satiates the sweet tooth, but also brings back fond memories of childhood all at the same time. It's also gluten-free, grain-free, and soy-free, so plenty of people can get in on a healthy dose of nostalgic nutrition. I've liked all the ones that I've tried, but the fruity one is definitely my favorite, although the peanut butter is a close second. If you want to support the channel and support your own health with a nutritious breakfast, then consider clicking the link down below and use my code AIDEN, that's A-Y-D-I-N, to get $5 off your order and try Magic Spoon for yourself to find your own favorite flavor. Let me know which one you guys like the best. But now that we've got our bowl of guilt-free goodness in hand, it's time to dig into the historical and political background of Ukraine that led up to the Russian invasion of 2022. And to do that, we have to start with some history. To cover the entire history of the country known as Ukraine, whose capital was also that of the Kievan Rus, a broad federation of Slavic, Baltic, and Finnic peoples during the 19th through the 13th centuries, and contains the city of Lviv, or Lvov, which was the capital of the Kingdom of Poland in the 14th century, and around that same time period, what is now the Chervinisti Oblast was also part of the Principality of Moldavia, which was the historical precursor state to much of modern-day Moldova and Romania, Basically, it's more than just a little bit of a daunting task. So daunting that I'm still not exactly sure where Latveria and Bessarovia, Estonia, and other fictional countries fit into the history here. I don't have any historical or political reasons to say that about Estonia, by the way. I'm saying it because the very existence of Tommy Cash probably should cost them their nation status. But to actually look at history. After the dissolution of the Kievan Rus, what would become Ukraine would be ruled over by numerous powers, including the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, Austria-Hungary, the Ottoman Empire, and the Tsardom of Russia. And if you've been conquered by the Polish during their off-season of saving Christendom from the Ottomans, 
then you know that you've had your fade run just a little bit. Point is, the history of Ukraine is complex and deeply interconnected with many other peoples, nations, and empires. We're going to be looking deeply at history here, but for the sake of brevity, and if you look at this video's runtime, you can see how succinct it is, we should start not with ancient history, but instead in the 20th century. For anything earlier than that, you'll have to start with Tursas albums. Following the Russian February Revolution of 1917, ending in the abdication of Tsar Nicholas II, who was brutally murdered not long after, the Ukraine Central Parliament, the Rada, was formed and subsequently declared themselves a new state, the Ukrainian People's Republic, an autonomous part of the Russian Republic. However, this was short-lived as the Republic collapsed following the Russian October Revolution later that year, resulting in Bolshevik control over the government in Russia. When it became clear that the Ukrainian Rada had no intention to follow suit in joining the Union, the Bolsheviks similarly attempted to seize power there. While the Ukrainian People's Republic began to sever ties with Bolshevik Russia in late 1917, at the same time, several parallel governments, namely the Bolshevik Ukrainian People's Republic of Soviets, aka Bopper, were formed, adding to the instability in the region and culminating in the Red Army capturing the capital of Kiev in February of 1918. This occupation quickly ended with aid from the German army, which then disbanded the Rada and helped establish yet another short-lived government in the form of the Hetmanate Dictatorship, which directly opposed the Bolsheviks. In late 1918, conflict broke out between another breakaway Ukrainian government, the Western Ukrainian People's Republic, and Poland following the Western Republic's declaration of the city of Lviv as its capital, despite the city's majority Polish population and, as previously mentioned, being the historical capital of the Kingdom of Poland. The similarly short-lived Western Republic also claimed territory of Transcarpathia, historically part of what is now Hungary, Czechoslovakia, or Romania, with its most famous historical leader, of course, being Vigo the Transcarpathian, pictured here. In less than one year, the Hetman government was overthrown and its leaders fled to Germany, with the remaining government reorganizing as the Directorate in 1919. However, this government too was plagued with external and internal pressures, most notably, at this point, a third parallel socialist government that also considered itself the legitimate government of Ukraine. And by November of 1920, the Bolsheviks and supporters of that parallel government, the Ukrainian Socialist Soviet Republic, and if all of these different governments are starting to blend together and sound about as coherent as describing the Great War between Bengis, Scrungo, and Floppa, at least it's not as confusing as the time that Catholic France teamed up with Protestant Sweden to beat up on the Habsburgs, a true embodiment of autism made physically manifest. Much like this. Regardless, the Ukraine Socialist Soviet Republic gained control of the country following the signing of the Polish-Soviet Peace Treaty of Riga, and in December of 1922, Ukraine would become one of the founding members of the Union of Socialist Soviet Republics, the USSR, joined by the Russian, Belarusian, and Transcaucasian Republics. Finally, reverse Rachel Dolezal. Although today there are some reports among citizens in former Soviet states, particularly in some younger people, of a type of nostalgia or even anomoya, that is, nostalgia for a time that one has not lived through, I would imagine it would be difficult to locate too many people with a strong sense of temporal wanderlust to return to the formal years of Ukraine under the USSR, particularly during the 1930s, as between 1931 and 32, estimates of up to 10 million Ukrainians died in the massive famine known as the Holodomor. Although scholars still debate the exact cause of the tragedy, and some even debate on whether or not the term genocide is appropriate to describe it, for my part I think the term genocide is apt, rather than a series of catastrophic policy errors, the kind of shitty free pass that the Anglos give themselves to get away with the Irish potato famine. The loss of life was nonetheless unfathomably tragic. As mentioned, there is no consensus on the cause, but on the more accidental side of the argument, historians may argue that the issues lay in the vast amounts of grain Russia imported from Ukraine in previous good years of harvest, leaving them with little in the way of reserves, and in the failure of collectivization of farming to quickly expand the scope of the meat and dairy industries. On the more intentional side of the argument, preceding the famine, the Soviets had begun the process of dekulakization, which was the systematic, quote, liquidation of kulaks, peasant farmers who owned more than eight acres of land via imprisonment, execution, exile, or internment in labor camps, with their land being collectivized. Outside of the heinous nature of such a practice on paper, the belief was that reallocating the farmland to the state would result in increases in yield. That prediction arose in part from hypotheses of the likes of people like Trofim Lysenko and other Soviet scientists who rejected the ideas of gradual evolution as proposed by Mendel and Darwin, and instead proposed that changes in environment during a single organism's lifespan would produce changes in its direct offspring to be more well adapted to that environment, 
a concept known as Lamarckism. Although Lamarckism gained popularity across the Soviet Union in the 1930s, for Lysenko in particular, he attempted to evidence Lamarckism by noting that pea seeds germinated faster in colder temperatures and concluded that rather than the pea plant being highly adaptable to different temperatures, that instead growing one generation of pea plants in colder temperatures made the next generation more well adapted to the cold. He also believed that some types of plants could spontaneously change into other types of plants, for example wheat into rye, and what species a bird would grow up to be in maturity was dependent on what it was fed as a chick. To us, of course, these beliefs are absurd pseudoscience that sound a bit like Pokemon Hammer and Sickle, but to Lysenko and the Soviets at large, these hypotheses were evidence of the existence of, quote, revolutionary leaps in evolution that mirrored Marxist theory. Although Lysenko's ideas were not implemented specifically in the 1930s in Ukraine, Lamarckism was popular at the time and likely informed some of the Soviet beliefs in the benefit of collectivization of farming that led to the Holodomor. Lysenko's ideas would, however, go on to be responsible for the Great Chinese Famine, which killed tens of millions of people, with estimates as high as 55 million, resulting in part from the practice of planting seeds too close together as, according to Lysenko, plants of the same class would never compete with one another. And if you think that sounds stupid, just look up what they thought about sparrows. Man, the Soviets really did suck at Pokemon, huh? Look, I'm just trying to make this incredibly depressing part of history slightly less horrible to listen to. The point is, for as ridiculous as we see these ideas today, because they align with Marxist theory, they were accepted over Mendelian agricultural theories. In 1939, the Nazis invaded Poland, followed shortly by the Soviet invasion of that country, kicking off World War II, and resulting in the country being annexed by both powers, with Germany taking the West and the Soviet Union adding the East region of Kresy, which includes Lviv, into the Ukrainian, Lithuanian, and Belarusian Soviet republics. The following year, the Soviets pressured Romania under threat of war to remove their forces from the Bessarabia, northern Bukovnia, and Herzl regions, which would become part of the Moldavian Socialist Soviet Republic and the Ukraine SSR. Following the end of the war, these regions, as well as Kresy and Carpathian Ruthenia, again, regions that historically had been part of Romania, Poland, and Czechoslovakia, respectively, became part of the Ukraine SSR. Before that, though, in 1941, Nazi Germany launched Operation Barbarossa, in a move that historians would describe as kind of a big oof, occupying many areas of the Soviet Union, primarily in the Ukraine SSR. During the push east, the Nazis became aware of the existence of Ukrainian nationalist forces within the Ukraine SSR with whom they could align in their war effort. Nazi Foreign Affairs Minister Joachim von Ribbentrop, whose name sounds like he was personally handcrafted by Yakub, a name so white it circles back around to being black again, revitiligo kind of nomenclature, the Sean King of names one might say. Anyway, he was in communique with none other than Wilhelm Canaris of the planned formation of a legion of Ukraine nationalists to fight beside the Wehrmacht and of possible support for Ukrainian insurrection in Galicia, under the direction of the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, or OUN, led by Riko Jari, Andrzej Melnik, and Stefan Bandera, who already had close contact with German military intelligence, codenamed Operation Bergbauhilfe. Canaris was ordered to make preparations with the Ukrainians so that, quote, a revolt will break out in Galician Ukraine, which has as its goal the destruction of everything Polish and the Jews. In February of 1941, Melnik was contacted by the Nazi government, instructing him to provoke civil disobedience once the Red Army began to crack. The Bandera and Melnik nationalist groups were responsible for sabotage and the creation of diversions in the region. In June of that year, Jerry sent a telegram to Hitler requesting the inclusion of the Organization of Ukraine Nationalists into the German Wehrmacht to fight for a free Ukraine. In the same month, Bandera, via the OUN, issued the Act of Proclamation of Ukraine Statehood, which declared Ukraine an independent state from the Soviet Union. This proclamation stated that an independent Ukraine would, quote, work closely with the National Socialist Greater Germany under the leadership of its leader Adolf Hitler, which is forming a new order in Europe and the world and is helping the Ukrainian people free itself from the Moscovite occupation. Although the Ukrainian nationalists of the Bandera Group had helped incite insurrections in cooperation with German troops that aided the Nazi advance, they were not prepared to subordinate themselves unconditionally to German interests and members of the group around Stefan Bandera declared openly that they would work against the Germans if their wishes were not met. Similarly, in July, the head of the newly declared Ukrainian state, Yaroslav Stetsko, wrote in his autobiography, quote, Although I consider Moscow, which in fact held Ukraine in captivity, and not Jewry, to be the main and decisive enemy, I nonetheless appreciate the undeniably harmful and hostile role of the Jews, who are helping Moscow enslave Ukraine. I therefore support the destruction of the Jews and the expedience of bringing German methods of exterminating Jewry to Ukraine, 
barring their assimilation and the like. For the Ukrainian nationalists, the true threat to Ukraine was Moscow and the Bolsheviks, and it was based on that belief that they likely saw the Nazis as the only group capable of aiding them in becoming independent of either. In the next months, as troops continued to move towards Moscow, Hitler defined the occupied region as the Reich Commissariat Ukraine under Nazi control, one of many such zones planned for the future that Hitler had envisioned for the Reich. Heinrich Himmler formed the Ukrainian Auxiliary Police, which was split into two categories, the Schutzmannschaft, or Protection Team, which was tasked with carrying out anti-Jewish atrocities, along with combating pro-Soviet partisan resistance, and the second group simply referred to as the Ukrainian Police, which operated under the guidance of the SS and was given special autonomy from the Reich Commissariat. In addition to bombs dropped during the conquest of Ukraine, the Nazis also dropped thousands of leaflets across the region, asking Ukrainians to abandon the Red Army and promising that the only enemy of the Germans was the Jews and Bolshevism, not Ukrainians. Despite that claim, and despite his government communicating with Bandera and the Ukrainian nationalists, Hitler was openly no friend of the Slavic peoples of Ukraine, who he saw as subhuman, and instead had his own intentions for the country, namely that it was to be part of the German Lebensraum, and intended to colonize the region with German settlers, calling it Germany's India, further evidence that Hitler was not the best Civ player in history. For this reason, in late 1941 and into 1942, the Germans quickly turned on the Ukrainian nationalists who had helped cause the upheaval in the region, precipitating their invasion, resulting in the assassination of Melnik's associates, likely by Bandera's own agents, and shortly thereafter the condemnation of all of the followers of Bandera himself as enemies of the Reich, arresting Bandera, Stetsko, and about 300 OUN members in September of 1941. Yeah, the Krauts turned the nationalists against each other and then arrested them all anyway, now under the control of Nazi Germany, and having largely eliminated the nationalist leaders, regardless of their own involvement, the Commissariat similarly turned on the Ukrainian people, beginning with the seizure of Ukrainian and Jewish property, including homes and winter clothing, while the people were charged exorbitant taxes. As mentioned, the Nazis saw Ukrainians as Untermensch, summarized in the attitude of Commissar Eric Koch, who stated that, quote, If I find a Ukrainian who is worthy of sitting at the same table with me, I must have him shot. To rub salt in the still fresh wounds, the Germans forcibly ejected peasants from their collective farms and handed them over to German settlers in regions newly designated as ethnic German colonies. A third of the nation's cattle was seized, and Ukrainians were banned from selling or purchasing both dairy products and bread, and once again, much as with the Soviets just a decade prior, Ukrainian farmers' goods were largely confiscated. Goods were not all that were confiscated by the Germans as tens of thousands of Ukrainians were deported to Germany to work in labor camps, which was propagandized in a newspaper campaign called Letters from the Reich, which alleged to publish letters from Ukrainians living in Germany. These letters included statements such as, We all sang to music on the trains to work. There is great camaraderie with the Germans. There is a lot of freedom and shopping. Going into 1942, the Germans search specifically for Ukrainian Jews went into full effect. And although there are countless reports of brutality and murders carried out by Ukrainian auxiliaries serving under the SS, there are also many reports of Ukrainian resistance even in the face of punishment should they be caught sheltering Jews. The public was further incentivized to assist in the Holocaust, with German propaganda at the time emphasizing the quote, Jewish face of Bolshevism, cultivating further anti-Semitism in the Ukrainian population and bolstering the willingness of many Ukrainians to assist the German efforts in the mass detention and murder of Jews. In all, more than 900,000 Jews are estimated to have been killed in the Ukrainian portion of the Holocaust, but the Special Extermination Force, the Einsatzgruppe, also killed countless communists, Polish intelligentsia, and Ukrainian nationalists in their conquest of the country. The total number of non-Jews in Ukraine who were victims of the Nazi extermination policies reached an estimate of 3 million people. After the surrender of the Nazis at the Battle of Stalingrad in February of 1943, the tides began to change in Ukraine, as the Soviets pushed back into the region, and by the fall of 1944, nearly all areas of ethnic Ukraine were under Soviet control. In their retreat, the Germans engaged in scorched earth tactics in the, quote, zone of destruction, similarly to how the Soviets had done during their own retreat several years prior. This left 28,000 villages and 714 cities and towns in Ukraine in total or partial ruin. The center of Kiev, for instance, was 85% demolished, and the second largest city, Kharkiv, was about 70% in ruins. More than 19 million people were left homeless. 
Despite the material destruction being brought back into the Soviet Union, Ukraine's previous borders were more permanently expanded to include, as previously mentioned, Transcarpathia or Carpathian Ruthenia, Krasy, Northern Bukovnia, and Bessarabia. Many Ukrainians in other countries were turned by choice, but others were repatriated by force, and of those, tens of thousands were executed or sent to labor camps as, quote, unreliable citizens of the Soviet Union. The typical type of kindness one could expect from Laurenti Beria. It's lucky we both now live in the new Soviet Union, or you and your wife and your family will be a pile of dust on the floor of a crematorium toilet. <sighs> Tommy, love! Oh, my stomach's rumbling. Further, the Soviets continued to engage in often poor decision-making regarding agriculture, leading to ongoing food shortages in the years following the war. The Soviets also engaged in educational propaganda, teaching children about the historical connections between Slavic states under the Kievan Rus, but specifically that these connections meant that Ukraine had always desired to be part of Russia, and emphasized that children and adults see themselves as Soviet citizens first, not as Ukrainians. Although there are countless important events that occurred between the end of World War II with the reintegration of Ukraine into the USSR and modernity, I have predominantly focused on the events leading up to Ukraine's initial independence through the Second World War for a number of reasons, namely because it's relevant when discussing the existence of currently operating groups such as the Azov Battalion and Right Sector that use a lot of Nazi imagery to understand the historical importance of specific figures, namely Stefan Bandera, but also to explicate how the borders of modern Ukraine became what they are, and why they include regions with large populations of non-ethnic Ukrainians. One of those regions, Crimea, has a large ethnic Russian population, and in 1954 was ceded from the Ukraine SSR to the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic as, quote, affirmation of the great fraternal love and trust of the Russian people for Ukraine. Meanwhile, in the West, with no such love of the Russian people at the time, in 1959, the Eisenhower administration established the Captive Nations Committee as an anti-communism advocacy group, and the co-chair of which was none other than former OUN leader and arguable Nazi collaborator Yaroslav Stetsko. His fellow nationalist leader, Bandera, was not quite as lucky, being killed in the same year believed to have been poisoned by Soviet agents. As the system of a down song goes, don't eat the fish, and they would know, being Armenian. Following the aforementioned issues with food shortages, which reached critical levels in 1963, Soviet First Secretary Nikita Khrushchev was removed and replaced with Leonid Brezhnev, who remained in power until 1982, during which time he primarily focused on attempts to maintain stability rather than engaging in the social experimentation of most of his predecessors. Although perhaps he should have focused on maintaining the stability of his eyebrows. We in this finna get crunk, eyebrows on fleek, the he also seemed more than just a little bit preoccupied with making out with other Russian political figures. But that's not really important. Just kind of funny. What the hell was that? <laughs> Probably some, you know, European goodbye thing he picked up in London. I, well, it's not European. Huh? It felt French. In the 1960s and 70s, Ukrainian nationalism, though deemed bourgeois by the Soviets, was again on the rise, resulting in arrests, imprisonment, and increased police surveillance. Despite both cultural and legal attempts at silencing Ukrainian nationalism, however, in the mid-1980s, Ukrainian-Canadian political scientist Bodan Krachenko posited that, quote, Ukrainian national identity is stronger today than ever in the past. And speaking of the past, as the 1980s continued, it became increasingly obvious that the Soviet Union was a thing of it. So let's shift our attention then to Ukraine after the fall of the Soviet Union. After the death of Brezhnev in 1982, in 1985, Mikhail Gorbachev, surely best remembered for bringing Pizza Hut to the East, assumed the office of General Secretary, who sought to revitalize the stagnating Soviet economy through two prongs of change, perestroika, or restructuring, and glasnost, or openness. The later of which, with the government no longer engaging in the excessive police repression under previous Soviet leaders, quickly led to citizens beginning to question openly just about every aspect of their government. Gorbachev made strides to improve relations with the West by removing troops from Afghanistan and seemed willing to reduce his nuclear arsenal. And just four years after Gorbachev came to power, in 1989, the Iron Curtain was raised and the Berlin Wall came crumbling down. On December 2nd and 3rd of that year, just weeks before the wall fell, Gorbachev met with then-President George H.W. Bush at the Malta Summit to discuss the rapid changes happening in Europe. 
During this talk, Bush argued that his administration had not condescended against the Soviet Union during recent events, and that he had decided not to, quote, climb on the Berlin Wall and make broad declarations, which Gorbachev recognized as a sign of political goodwill and, well, as mentioned, just a few weeks later there was no more wall for Bush to climb on top of, surely to his chagrin as we all know how much the Bushes like knocking down buildings. Soon after, on February 9th of 1990, U.S. Secretary of State James Baker, who was also present at the Malta summit, met with Gorbachev in Moscow. In this talk, Baker said that the U.S. allies currently were still requesting her military presence in the form of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which is an intergovernmental military alliance formed largely as a defensive pact of nations in opposition to the Soviet Union in Europe, but that the second these allies were opposed to U.S. military involvement, the troops would be sent home. Gorbachev responded that a unified Germany would probably demand as much, to which Baker reassured him that, quote, NATO is the mechanism for securing the U.S. presence in Europe. If NATO is liquidated, there will be no such mechanism in Europe. We understand that not only for the Soviet Union, but for other European countries, as well, it is important to have guarantees that if the United States keeps its presence in Germany within the framework of NATO, not an inch of NATO's present military jurisdiction will spread in an eastern direction. We believe that the consultations and discussions within the framework of the 2 plus 4 mechanism should guarantee that Germany's unification will not lead to NATO's military organization spreading to the east. Gorbachev further proposed that a unified Germany could be both part of NATO and the Warsaw Pact, which was a similar alliance amongst the Soviet states as NATO had across the west basically placing it under the protection of both defensive agreements and seemingly assuring that Germany would be where East and West were to meet in collaboration, not in opposition to one another. However, Gorbachev went on to state that whether or not Germany became part of NATO, that any broadening of the NATO zone was not acceptable, and Baker fully agreed. The next day, Gorbachev met with German Chancellor Helmut Kohl, who also seemed to agree with both men. On April 11th, British Foreign Minister Douglas Hurd met with Gorbachev and similarly expressed that Britain, quote, recognized the importance of doing nothing to prejudice Soviet interests and dignity. On May 31st, Bush also reassured Gorbachev at the Washington summit that, quote, we have no intention, even in our thoughts, to harm the Soviet Union in any fashion. That's why we are speaking in favor of German unification in NATO without ignoring the wider context of the CSCE, that's the Commission on Security and Cooperation in Europe, he went on to say that the interests of the West, quote, corresponds to the Soviet interests as well. In June, in a meeting with Thatcher, the Iron Lady herself similarly expressed that we must find ways to give the Soviet Union confidence that its security would be assured. Thus, it seems that Western leaders were all mostly in agreement that they would work with Gorbachev as part of that collaborative work involved in not expanding NATO and potentially threatening the Soviet Union. Hell, on July 17th, in a phone call with Gorbachev, Bush extended an invitation to NATO and an agreement to invite regular diplomatic contact between NATO and Gorbachev's government to help form a future for Europe that included, not excluded, the USSR. Gorbachev's willingness to work with the West and the West's seeming willingness to work with Gorbachev was not well received by all, as diehard communist supporters were greatly dissatisfied with the peace talks culminating in the failed August Revolution of 1991 in an attempt to overthrow him. What did change after the revolution that's relevant for our interests, however, was that the Ukrainian Rada announced its independence from the Soviet Union and placed Leonid Kravchuk, chairman of the Ukrainian SSR, as president. His presidency and the decision to officially secede was voted for on December 5th. That same week, on December 8th, Gorbachev, along with Kravchuk, Boris Yeltsin, the president of the Russian SFSR, and the leaders of Belarus, signed the Belovez Accords, effectively ending the existence of the Soviet Union and establishing in its place the Commonwealth of Independent States, CIS. That's a CIS mail. Now, I don't understand, where does that, is this a new phrase? Yes, it's a way of marginalizing a normal person. Although containing Ukraine did mean that this alliance of the CIS also did include Transcarpathia. But anyway, CIS was an intergovernmental organization designed to encourage economic and political cooperation between its members. With the union dissolved on December 25th, Gorbachev handed over all his remaining power to Yeltsin, and from Gorbachev's perspective at the time, having just spent the last two years being repeatedly assured that the West not only wanted to welcome Russia into Europe, but that world leaders had no intentions of expanding NATO further east, he must have felt that the future for global politics was looking bright. But as Yeltsin would quickly learn, the promises made were thoroughly and demonstrably hollow. So that was a lie. 
Perhaps it is because of the depths of this duplicity that rather than admit the West had betrayed its promises, that in 2014 Gorbachev said in an interview with Maxim Korshnov of Russia Beyond that the topic of NATO discussion was never once brought up in his talks with Baker, which is where the idea that Putin invented the entire notion of the not one inch east quote originates. But the problem for that little narrative is just a few years later, in 2017, the US government declassified the minutes of the meeting with James Baker and Gorbachev to show that the two did in fact discuss NATO expansion in the way previously described. Of course, you should make up your own mind as always, friends, but as a basic issue of Occam's Razor, I must ask, what is more likely an accurate representation of that meeting? The official notes taken during the meeting and declassified by the US government or the recollections of Gorbachev 14 years later after the US had engaged in massive NATO expansion, thereby violating any promises made at the time. It's understandable why he might want to remember things differently, as the West continually betrayed its promises to Russia, sort of turns the biggest dub of the man's career, of peacefully ending the Cold War, into a bit of an L. One could also argue that, well, sure, Baker did say that, and sure, plenty of Western leaders reiterated similar sentiments to Gorbachev, but joke's on him, get it in writing next time, sucker. And I have legitimately heard several people make that exact argument, as well as the argument that, well, we made those promises to the USSR and not Russia, so it doesn't really count. But in either of those cases, I need to ask, if those really are the arguments, and I've heard them being made, that Western leaders repeatedly intentionally lied to Gorbachev over and over during political global peace talks. And that's fine because they didn't sign anything, or because the deal was made with a country that no longer existed, so we got him on a technicality. Then why is it surprising that someone like Vladimir Putin is distrustful of the intentions of NATO towards Russia? The lies or half-truths told to Gorbachev about expansion were not the end, however, of the West courting of Russia in assurance that NATO was no threat to her sovereignty. In October of 1993, Boris Yeltsin had a conversation with Secretary of State Warren Christopher discussing the new NATO program, the Partnership for Peace, and that Russia was intended to be included in this partnership. Yeltsin said the proposal was genius and was seemingly fully on board with the idea of the new Russian Federation moving forward with the rest of Europe towards more cooperation. In Christopher's personal memoir published in 2001, he remarked that he said the partnership would inevitably lead to NATO membership for other nations, and that the president was simply drunk at the time and didn't understand him. To be fair, not a ridiculous claim, as old Boris was something of a notorious drunk, an impressive feat for a Russian to be a notorious drunk, but that was the case for good reason. However, the declassified American-written cable notes on the meeting, released in 2018, paint a different picture of that account. In these notes, Christopher discussed Russia's full participation in the future security of Europe, that no country would be excluded, and that it would be a partnership, not a membership. In response to this proposal, Yeltsin stated that it served to dissipate all tension in Russia regarding Eastern European states' aspirations to join NATO, and that, quote, it would have been an issue for Russia, particularly if it left us in a second-class status. Now, under your idea that we are all equal, and it will ensure equal participation on the basis of partnership. Asking Christopher to pass on his enthusiastic approval of the idea to President Clinton, making Yeltsin neither the first nor surely the last person to mistakenly give their enthusiastic approval to Bill Clinton while intoxicated. Oh, and I actually did all that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I didn't, but... Yeah. In his memoir, Christopher further contended that the apparent misunderstanding on Yeltsin's part, one which in the notes he did absolutely nothing to attempt to clarify at the time, was due to Russian Foreign Minister Andrei Kozarev intentionally failing to inform Yeltsin that this partnership program inherently would result in NATO expansion. However, another declassified document in a meeting held between Christopher and Kozarev just earlier that same day, as the meeting with Gorbachev, Christopher told him that there was no predetermined new members in NATO and that the US was emphasizing the partnership for peace as being open to all. Kozirev actually asked Christopher specifically if he was sure there were not several predetermined new member states, and he repeated that no, there were not, and that the partnership was again open to all, presumably including Russia. As such, despite how Christopher chose to remember these events, the actual reporting makes it fairly clear that he pitched the idea of the partnership for peace as an alternative to NATO expansion and one in which Russia would be welcome to be a partner, not a mere member when even from his own account years later, despite his spotty memory, that was never really the case. 
It wasn't just Yeltsin who heard this kind of mixed messaging from Americans concerning NATO and the Partnership for Peace. On January 11th of 1994, President Clinton met with Czech President Václav Havel and told him that the partnership wasn't really a partnership, but instead a fast-track program into NATO membership, and that the US did not intend to, quote, draw another line dividing Europe a few hundred miles to the east. Although as he continued, he clarified that this seemingly wasn't because the US didn't intend to exclude Russia, but rather because, at the time, there was no consensus on how to extend security guarantees of NATO, and because they were unsure of how the Russians would respond to NATO expansion via the partnership. In September of 94, according to the memoirs of Strobe Talbot, then Deputy Secretary of State, Clinton again reassured Yeltsin, quote, emphasizing inclusion, not exclusion. NATO expansion is not anti-Russian. It is not intended to be exclusive of Russia. And there is no imminent timetable. The broader, higher goal is European security, unity, and integration, a goal I know you share. Although Talbot was present for this meeting, the official notes on it have not yet been declassified. Whether or not Talbot's account is accurate, a letter sent from Yeltsin to Clinton in November illustrates that the Russian president was dismayed by the US's open and ongoing plans to hasten in broadening of NATO but reiterated his desire for Russia to work with, not against NATO in the form of the proposed partnership. But clearly, Yeltsin had had a change of heart, as on December 1st, Kozirev refused to sign up for the Partnership for Peace, and on the 5th, at the Budapest summit of the CSCE, Yeltsin accused Clinton of sowing the seeds of mistrust. On the same day, while things were souring between Yeltsin and the West, Ukraine, Belarus, and Kazakhstan signed up for the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons in the Budapest Memorandum, agreeing to disarm and transfer said disarmed nuclear warheads to Russia in exchange for promises from the US, the UK, and Russia that they would be protected. As such, while talks of NATO expansion were concerning the Russians, several former Soviet states elected to remove their own nuclear deterrence that would have offered them an element of protection from invasion without the need for NATO membership. There were six aspects to this memorandum that were designed to protect the denuclearizing nations, agreed to, again, by the US, UK, and Russia. Those being... Number one, respect independence and the sovereignty in their existing borders. Next slide. Refrain from the threat or the use of force against them. Next slide. Refrain from using economic pressure on them to influence the border. Next, next slide, next slide. Who the hell, what the malarkey is this? Seek immediate Security Council action to provide assistance if they should become a victim of an act of aggression or an object of a threat of aggression in which nuclear weapons are used. Next slide. Refrain from the use of nuclear arms against them. Next slide. Consult with one another if the questions arise regarding those commitments. What day is it? Al Gore visited Russia later that month to try and smooth over ongoing tensions raised during the Budapest summit. But his method of doing so was to repeat the same song and dance as Christopher, which was to claim that Yeltsin had simply misunderstood that the US and NATO's intention were to expand, although he did reiterate that this expansion would be gradual and would in no way leave Russia out of Europe's security architecture. In May of 95, Clinton himself traveled to Moscow to reassure Yeltsin of the same thing, that NATO expansion would be slow and gradual and that the US had no intentions to undermine Russia's security interests. However, Yeltsin also remained adamant that, quote, I see nothing but humiliation for Russia if you proceed. Why do you want to do this? We need a new structure for pan-European security, not old ones. But for me to agree to the borders of NATO expanding towards those of Russia, that would constitute a betrayal on my part of the Russian people. And the two agreed that NATO expansion would at the very least be pushed back till after the 1996 Russian and US elections although Yeltsin did ask if expansion could wait till the new millennium. Clinton also again asked Yeltsin to consider finally joining the PFP, and Yeltsin did just that a month later in July, remarking positively on building a partnership and friendship between Russia and the West. But as we'll soon see, at least for Russia, the Partnership for Peace was never a real partnership, and was intended how Clinton had described it in private to the Czech officials, as a fast track for NATO membership albeit only for certain states, of which Russia was definitely not included. For the Russians, however, numerous declassified documents released are quite consistent in that they were under the impression that Russia was meant to be part of Europe, not separate from it, and the numerous meetings between the Western leaders and both Yeltsin and Gorbachev were seen as part of a legitimate attempt at diplomacy, 
both to prevent the redrawing of the lines so recently just erased after so many decades of animosity, but also to create an inclusive Europe and put the Cold War past behind both the West and the East. Moreover, both the Russian and American documents make it clear that Russia was strongly against NATO expansion from the get-go, but the Americans quickly changed their tune on what was to happen with NATO between the peaceful fall of the Soviet Union, wherein the promise to Gorbachev was again not one inch east, to 1993 when Yeltsin was being told that the Partnership for Peace was a true partnership, not membership into NATO, that was open to Russia and that NATO would not be expanding anytime soon. To in 1995, when the story changed to, yes, NATO expansion is going to happen, it's going to happen soon, and that the US really wasn't that concerned with how the Russians felt about it, because Russia wasn't going to be allowed to be involved. To put that into modern parlance, in a single console generation, in the time it took for the PS5 to have, in fact, no games, the agreement went from not one inch east to, we're going east now, and there's nothing you can do about it, loser. If nothing else, at least Boris got to roast Clinton, if only once. Well, now for the first time, I can tell you that you're a disaster. <laughs> Around this same time in Ukraine, now denuclearized, October of 1995 saw the formation of the Social National Party, a far-right party that used the wolf spangle as its symbol, a symbol also used by the various German Wehrmacht and SS units, by Andrei Pryubi and Ola Tiahanibuk, a name to keep in mind as it will come up later in this timeline. On the 28th of June, 1996, the Ukraine Constitution was signed. It theoretically has separation of powers, but the president held significant sway. He or she nominates the prime minister, although this must be supported by a majority of the Rada. However, before the 2004 reforms, he could also just dismiss the prime minister for pretty much any reason. I bet there's some Canadians who wish that they could do that. Since then, only Parliament may dismiss the PM, and the president has become highly restricted in who may be selected as PM needing to be someone supported by the parliamentary majority. The president still possesses significant power, being able to dismiss parliament and suspend acts of the cabinet, for instance. But despite the broad powers of the president, after 2004, as affirmed by parliament, a lot of power was bestowed to the prime minister. Back in Russia, despite the previous frustration Yeltsin expressed towards the West's unwillingness to not engage in NATO expansion, he continued to work with them openly, and in May of 97, he, together with NATO leaders, signed the NATO-Russia Founding Act, expressing their joint determination to, quote, build together a lasting and inclusive peace in the Euro-Atlantic area on the principles of democracy and cooperative security. That same month, Yeltsin and Ukraine's second president, Leonid Kuchma, signed a friendship agreement which included intent to respect each other's rights and freedoms. The Russian Duma, their parliament, further ratified the treaty in 1999. In July of 97, President Kuchma met with NATO leaders in Madrid, where they signed the NATO-Ukraine Charter, establishing a distinctive partnership between Ukraine and the Defensive Alliance. Under this partnership, a NATO-Ukraine commission planned to meet at least twice per year to discuss said relationship. Despite this new partnership, when the former Soviet states ascended to full NATO membership in March of 99, Ukraine was not amongst them, instead including the Czech Republic, Hungary, and Poland. If nothing else, it could be said that Clinton was good on his word of at least waiting until after the 1996 elections to induct these nations. And further, it was pushed back to closer to Yeltsin's desired date of 2000, which is pretty much the only time in this series of events that it can be said that the US truly seemed to act in good faith towards Russia. It's important to note that not only were American government officials aware of how the Russians would likely react to NATO expansion, given the persistent objections raised by Gorbachev and Yeltsin, similar concerns were also made public by Western foreign policy experts at the time, including American diplomat and former ambassador to the Soviet Union, George Kennan. In an interview with New York Times journalist Thomas Friedman, conducted after May of 1998, when NATO permitted expansion and membership for the aforementioned nations, Kennan stated of the issue, I think this is the beginning of a new Cold War. I think the Russians will gradually react quite adversely, and it will affect their policies. I think this is a tragic mistake. There was no reason for this whatsoever. No one was threatening anybody else. This expansion would make the founding fathers of this country turn over in their graves. We have signed up to protect a whole series of countries, even though we have neither the resources nor the intention to do so in any serious way. NATO expansion was simply a light-hearted action by a Senate that has no real interest in foreign affairs. What bothers me is how superficial and ill-informed the whole Senate debate was. I was particularly bothered by the references to Russia as a country dying to attack Western Europe. Don't people understand? 
Our difference in the Cold War was with the Soviet Communist regime. And now we are turning our back on the very people who mounted the greatest bloodless revolution in history to remove that Soviet regime. And Russia's democracy is as far advanced, if not further, as any of these countries we've just signed up to defend from Russia. Of course there was going to be a bad reaction from Russia. And then the NATO expanders will say that we always told you that that is how the Russians are. But this is just wrong. As such, it seems highly unlikely that the United States was somehow unaware of how the admittance of former Soviet states on the borders of Russia into NATO would be perceived of by the Russians. And back on the subject of admittance into NATO, perhaps one of the reasons for Ukraine's lack of admittance into the alliance was the growing concerns with corruption in the less than decade-old government. In September of 2000, Hirohi Gongads, a Ukrainian journalist who had been investigating alleged corruption in the Kuchma administration, disappeared. His beheaded body was found two months later in the forest outside of Kiev. Audio recordings supposedly taken by Kuchma's bodyguard, Nikola Milnichenko, eventually surfaced that purport to show Kuchma ordering the interior minister, Yuri Kravchenko, to organize the killing of Gongads. And when I say purport, I mean, well, just listen for yourself. I would like to ask you about this kind of form. I mean, to you, so that I don't forget this Gongadze. I'm... we're working on Meaning? I'm telling you, drive him out, throw him out, give him to the Chechens, <laughs> and then a ransom. We'll think it. We'll do it, so there. Meaning drive him out, I'm dressing, Blier. Leave him without his pants, let him sit there, I, I'd do it simply, Blier. But you don't just have to take my word or the word of Melnichenko on these tapes, as they were analyzed by the Bush Jr. administration in 2002. Not because the US had any particular interest in solving the death of a journalist, but because the tapes also included Kuchma discussing selling a Kolchuga radar system to Saddam Hussein. Apparently, they didn't see an issue with the whole murdering a journalist thing, which, unlike steel beams, are certainly something that can be melted by governments. The State Department, in fact, did deem that the tapes were legitimate, and Bush, livid with Kuchma, suspended 55 million in aid to Ukraine in October of that year. Again, over the radar thing, not so much the journalist murdering thing. To add to the perceived corruption of the Kuchma government, in April of 2001, Parliament passed a no-confidence motion against PM Viktor Yushchenko, who was forced to step down in the face of protests calling instead for Kuchma's resignation. The vote was carried out by parties allied with Kuchma, perhaps unsurprising as observers had been off-put when Kuchma nominated Yushchenko to be Prime Minister in the first place in 1999, as Yushchenko and his deputy Yulia Tymoshenko had been pushing through energy sector reforms that became unpopular with many of Kuchma's supporters. While they may have disagreed on energy, both Kuchma and Yushchenko were strongly in favor of both EU and NATO membership for Ukraine, and just a few years later, in 2004, Yushchenko returned to run for the office of president against Kuchma. The corruption of the Kuchma era continued to plague Yushchenko, however, as in September of 2004 he was poisoned with a lab-made dioxin at a dinner party. The former deputy chief of Ukraine's security service, Volodymyr Satsyuk, who held dual Ukrainian-Russian citizenship, was blamed, admittedly without much evidence, and he fled to Russia where he subsequently was protected from extradition. And speaking of problems with the borders, in 2003, Kuchma and Russian President Putin signed an agreement that the borders would be determined on the surface, vertical level. However, the exact border lines between the two countries remained fuzzy. With the two failing to reach any agreement by 2010, and work on demarcation only resumed in 2014. That is, up until 2014, no one was really even exactly sure where the borders of Ukraine were. 2004 saw several changes in regional politics, including Ola Tiahanibuk, again a name to keep in mind, becoming the head of the Social Nationalist Party, and attempted to clean up its image by abandoning that whole wolf spangle imagery, and changed the party name to Svoboda, meaning freedom. Additionally, Bulgaria, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Romania, Slovakia, and Slovenia all became NATO members in March of 2004, but Ukraine remained passed up for membership. In November, having recovered from his poisoning, Viktor Yushchenko, who was favored by Ukrainian nationalists, ran in the presidential election against Viktor Yanukovych, a candidate who favored diplomacy with Russia and for Ukraine remaining, in his words, quote, a European non-aligned state, referring to NATO membership, or lack thereof. Despite overcoming a poisoning, Yushchenko couldn't overcome Yanukovych in the race, and in November of 2004, Yanukovych was declared the victor. I, I mean, the victor of the election. Technically, they're both victors. Boo! You stink! The results were not well received, however, with many Ukrainians believing that Yanukovych had rigged the election. Not an unreasonable belief, given that he had been the prime minister under Kuchma following the resignation of Yushchenko, although both men were PM under Kuchma, for whatever that's worth. 
and leading to a series of protests called the Orange Revolution in reference to Yashchenko's campaign which used the color orange. These protests were led in part by then-People's Deputy and former Deputy Prime Minister for Energy and Coal Mining under the Kuchma administration, Yulia Tymoshenko, who was given the title of the movement's queen by some. And by some, I think we all know the kind of people who would do such a thing. First thing I do when I wake up, I check her Instagram and her Twitter to make sure I haven't missed anything she's posted. Sometimes she tweets the funniest things. And then, of course, I have to react to her Instagram story. Hard eyes, of course. <laughs> Sometimes she responds back. She responded back to me. Due to the protests, the Ukraine Supreme Court called for a revote to occur in January of 2005. Freedom House, a nonprofit funded primarily by the U.S. government and the U.S. Democratic Party's National Democratic Institute, helped fund and organize the, quote, largest civil regional election monitoring effort in Ukraine. It involved more than a thousand trained observers to ensure the election would be free and fair, although I cannot confirm nor deny their use of the same paneling used in 2020 to cover up voting areas. But then again, technology in election securing has certainly improved since 2005. These groups also helped organize exit polls, which gave Yushchenko an 11-point lead, something that surely could not have influenced voting in any way. The International Republican Institute and the National Democratic Institute also conducted training programs for Ukrainian political parties, some of which later joined the Yushchenko coalition. And you always do have to be a little bit careful when it comes to Americans training foreign political actors, as the last time we did that in Ireland, a bunch of Protestant people got car bombed, and Catholic people, and well, just about everyone in general. Do you really think ISIS has the balls, right? <laughs> to turn up in Belfast. <laughs> Belfast, the Champions League of Terrorism. <laughs> Further, the U.S. Agency for International Development, the National Endowment for Democracy, or NED, and you know if I'm giving you the acronym, it's because it's going to come up again, and the world stage is a lot like Scrabble, in that the U.S. generally are the only ones happy when acronyms are involved, as well as a few other foundations helped sponsor several U.S. organizations, including Freedom House, the International Republican Institute, the National Democratic Institute, the Solidarity Center, the Eurasia Foundation, and Internews to provide small grants and technical assistance to Ukrainian civil society, which could mean pretty much anything, so use your imagination. Whatever the reason, be it to protect or, dare I say, fortify a democratic election or otherwise, the United States was clearly invested in this second round of elections. And on the 23rd of January 2005, the earlier election results were overturned, with Yushchenko receiving 52% of the vote and becoming the third president of Ukraine. And I do think it's relevant to point out that this kerfuffle happened surrounding just the third president to really illustrate that all of these issues were occurring before Ukraine itself was even old enough to vote. And 15 years really is not that long of a time. As to put it into perspective, Ukraine was almost the exact same age as The Simpsons. And much like The Simpsons, it was all going well until a US president got involved about 10 years in and it started all going tits up. We need a nation closer to the Waltons than The Simpsons. Huh? Hey, we're just like the Waltons. We're praying for an end to the Depression, too. And speaking of the Simpsons episode featuring George H.W. Bush, there is some relevant serendipity related to today's topic there, too. Only as long as you keep the car full of gas, I'm happy. Mm. Well, you can always depend on that. In response to the Orange Revolution and the overturning of the initial election, a pro-Kremlin youth group movement, Nashi, which despite its name is not a Japanese pop-punk group, began organizing in early 2005, created by Vasily Yakimenko, who also sounds like he should be in a Japanese pop-punk group. Though, given the first name Vasily, rather than Nashi, I'd imagine it would be a group called Visual AK. Anyway, the goals of Nashi were stated to be opposition to anti-Semitism and Nazism in the country, which Yakomenko believed shared a hatred of then-President Vladimir Putin with the West, the latter of whom he said, quote, are living on the phobias of the Cold War and see Russia as a potential enemy. Yakomenko also was quoted as saying that, quote, previously Ukraine was a Russian colony, and now it is an American colony, and that the United States intended to make Russia one of its colonies as well. At least some Russians, it seems then, as far back as 2005, were convinced that the United States was involved in orchestrating or at least supporting the Orange Revolution and were influencing Ukrainian politics. I'm escaping to the one place that hasn't been corrupted by capitalism. Space! Troubles between Russia and Ukraine continued into 2006 as pricing and transit disputes between Yushchenko's government and the Russia state-owned Gazprom Energy Corporation resulted in a gas cutoff in January. 
lasting a couple of days and quickly causing supply issues in the many European countries that imported Russian gas via Soviet-era pipelines run through Ukraine, an issue that would be of ongoing concern for years to come, even into the 2020s. Further, Russia was still deeply invested in the possibility of Ukraine as well as Georgia being accepted as members of NATO, and the US was well aware of these concerns, as illustrated in a classified document sent to the Joint Chiefs, the Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, National Security Council, and NATO from Russian Ambassador William Burns in February of 2008, which was later exposed via WikiLeaks. According to the document, Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov did not believe the expansion of NATO was based on security concerns, but instead was a legacy of the Cold War, and that there was a growing tendency for its new member states to want to rewrite history. The document continues that, quote, "...integration into NATO would seriously complicate the many-sided Russian-Ukrainian relations, and that Russia would, quote, "...have to take appropriate measures." Remember, this is in 2006 that the US government was informed of this reality of geopolitics, so there's no real excuse for later confusion on this point. This was also during the War on Terror, when America was dumping munitions on every oil-rich sandpit they could find, ensuring that just going about one's daily life in these countries had about the same limb cost as human transmutation. Of course, the Sarani army itself, oh sorry, sorry, uh, the Sarani copy army, I don't know what the f we're actually invading, I'm American. An unnamed spokesman mentioned in the document stated that, quote, one has the impression that the present Ukrainian leadership regards rapprochement with NATO largely as an alternative to good neighborly ties with the Russian Federation. Further statements within the release indicate that the Russians did perceive increased NATO membership as a form of encirclement, and that while Russia was not opposed to Ukraine's cooperation with the West, they were concerned about it becoming a U.S. military ally, and that such actions could destabilize the region and potentially lead to violence or war. Yet despite these warnings to the Joint Chiefs that moving forward with NATO expansion would be seen as a military threat to Russia, in April of 2008, just a few months after these data were shared, George Bush publicly pressed for Ukraine and Georgia to become NATO members anyway, further evidence that George W. Bush breathed through his mouth, something further confirmed by a pretzel once nearly killing him. He was specifically warned not to expand NATO and just did it anyway. Oh, I can do it again. Okay. Just days later, NATO debated offering membership action plans to Croatia, Georgia, and Ukraine, and I was going to make a joke that none of these are real countries, but Putin beat me to the punch, as in response to this offer he told George Bush that Ukraine, quote, is not even a real nation-state. That's a bit of a bruh moment, but being serious, while it's impossible to know what exactly Putin meant by that quotation, following the Orange Revolution and the US involvement in previous Ukraine elections, it's possible that similarly to those in the Nashi movement who were supportive of Putin's government, Putin was reiterating the belief that the US government had essentially taken control of Ukraine and that it was no longer sovereign. With George Bush pushing for the admission of Georgia into NATO despite warnings from the Joint Chiefs, it should not have come as a radical shock to the US government when Russia invaded Georgia in August of 2008. The invasion led to a five-day war and resulted in increased Russian presence in the breakaway Georgian republics of Abkhazia and South Ossetia, which Russia subsequently recognized as independent states. Unsurprisingly, Ukrainian President Yushchenko condemned the invasion, and likely anticipating that Ukraine, being in a similar position politically as Georgia, may be the next target of Russia's aggression, began new talks with the EU regarding an association agreement during which EU officials intimated that Ukraine's future was within Europe. Despite these many agreements and talks and the pressing of George Bush himself, however, Ukraine had still not been extended an invitation to join NATO proper. Of course, part of that was likely due to concerns with Russia, but it may also have had something to do with issues of corruption and extremism within the nation, as evidenced by a seemingly unprompted report submitted to NATO from the Ukrainian government in November of 2008, detailing information about six radical groups operating within the country. These were the Eurasian Youth Union, a pro-Russia group operated by Alexander Dugin and believed to have been founded by the Kremlin. By the way, Alexander Dugin has had some interesting things to say in the past. The Ukrainian National Labour Party, a national socialist group that promoted anti-Semitism and was reported to cooperate with Svoboda and the Ukrainian Conservative Party. The Ukrainian Movement Against Illegal Immigration, an unregistered organization reported to have a following amongst neo-Nazis promoted white supremacy and was opposed to immigrants, obviously, I mean, it's in the title of the party. Although that doesn't necessarily mean anything, I mean, just look at the Scottish Nationalist Party. You have a symbol, the twisted cross, the saltire, or the swastika. You have a passionate belief in economic self-sufficiency known by the Nazis as autarky and the Scots as oil. And you also have the propensity of your elderly and middle-aged male supporters to expose their knees. Um, it's created a great deal of offence to many people in Scotland. Are you sorry for the offence it's caused? 
no, of course not. But which had two wings, a pro-Russian wing mostly based in Crimea, and a pro-Ukrainian wing. The Patriot of Ukraine, formerly the Youth Wing of Svoboda, which protested making Russian an official language in Kharkiv, advocated for social nationalism, and a cult of nation mentality, and anti-immigrant, anti-capitalist, and anti-globalist sentiments. Bratsvo, a Ukrainian nationalist group that venerates both Bandera and Stalin, yeah, confusing I know, and the Ukrainian National Assembly slash Ukrainian National Self-Defense Organization, or UNA-UNSO, which began as a collection of nationalist groups that venerated Mussolini and became militarized after the 1991 anti-Gorbachev coup attempt. The UNA-UNSO was reported to have participated in several regional conflicts in Moldova, Georgia, and Chechnya, supported the Ukraine without Kuchma movement, and favored Yushchenko in the 2004 elections. Let's just say there's a lot of veneration of a lot of different leaders of various political persuasions all going on in the same place around the same time, making Ukraine a big, complicated waifu love chart of political extremism, and the only thing the people they venerate have in common was their inability to do an honest day's work in their entire lives. Who's gonna win the power of the Axis? Adolf Drittler, Drippler, <laughs> or Joseph Stunton? <laughs> oh, <laughs> shut up! Benito Swagalini! <laughs> <laughs> I cannot say for sure why this report was submitted to NATO, but I would speculate it may have been to give NATO the impression that the Ukrainian government was aware of these groups and was working to respond to extremism in the nation. Although, based on the NATO report, it seemed that the Yushchenko government was concerned with far-right and neo-Nazi sympathies present in certain groups operating within the country. On January 22nd of 2010, while on his way out of office, having failed to secure a spot for re-election, that same government bestowed the title of Hero of Ukraine posthumously to Stefan Bandera, an act praised by the Ukrainian nationalists who already favored Yushchenko, and who do see Bandera as a war hero who fought against both Nazis and Soviets, but was criticized by others both within Ukraine and abroad who remembered Bandera as a Nazi collaborator, including the Simon Wiesenthal Center, the largest Jewish human rights organization in the US. This change was relatively short-lived, however, as the Yanukovych government, again, the man who won the first round of elections in 2004, replaced Yushchenko as the fourth president of Ukraine in February of 2010, and quickly vowed to repeal the honor and it was repealed less than a year later in January of 2011. The act of elevating Bandera to the title of hero was likely purely symbolic for Yushchenko's nationalistic base on his way out, but it's also likely that the decision to rescind the title was just as symbolic for Yanukovych's own base, which tended to include many Russian-speaking Ukrainians from the eastern parts of the country. It probably did mean something to a lot of Ukrainians, but the act itself seems to have been mostly political and performative. Yanukovych's new government seemed interested in getting back at previous administrations in other ways though as well, as they called for further investigation into the Melnichenko tapes, and Kuchma's potential involvement in the killing of the journalist in 2011. However, the Ukrainian courts ultimately rejected the use of the tapes due to an inability to authenticate them. Although, as previously mentioned, the Bush administration professed such an ability and stated that the tapes were in fact authentic. In October, Yanukovych called for Yushchenko's former PM and the candidate who ran against him in 2010, Yulia Tymoshenko, to be arrested under allegations of abuse of her office, due to her involvement in a gas deal between Ukraine, Russia, and several intermediary companies. The allegations were not so much that Tymoshenko had produced a deal that was harmful for Ukraine, but instead that she had overstepped the powers of her office to procure it. And for her involvement, she was sentenced to seven years in prison. The U.S. State Department spokeswoman Victoria Newland, another name to remember, described the act as politically motivated, and the EU ambassador to Ukraine called the condition of the trials inhumane. The jailing subsequently stalled negotiations with the European Union over improving trade and political ties. While it certainly looks like Yanukovych was going after his political rivals, it is perhaps worth noting that this was not the first time Tymoshenko had been jailed for issues of political corruption. As in 1997, she was arrested and charged with forging customs documents and smuggling gas while serving as the president of the United Energy Systems of Ukraine. Truly some Eastern Bloc shit. <laughs> Considering Tymoshenko's involvement as the Orange Revolution's queen, it is somewhat serendipitous that the anti-Orange committee and movement began in Russia just two months after her arrest. But not in response to it, and rather in response to the assassination of the authoritarian leader Muammar Gaddafi in Libya after the Arab Spring having ruled the nation since 1969. The Arab Spring protesters were concerned with low standards of living and income and unemployment, as well as Gaddafi's long rule in general, despite him having been popular in previous decades of that rule, perhaps due in large part to the relative higher standards of living in Libya compared to other countries in the region, attributable to Libya's vast oil and gas resources. Although certainly not standards directly comparable to the modern West, after all, that's exactly what they were protesting. 
After Gaddafi's forces began to regain control of the country embroiled in protest, the Arab Spring protesters cried out for support from the West and received it, with NATO forces neutralizing the Libyan Air Force during Operation Odyssey Dawn. But while it may seem to a casual observer that these actions were purely humanitarian to help topple a dictator, the reality of geopolitics is rarely so simple. Several other nations, including Qatar, also known as everyone's favorite slave trading state and international broadcast center, France, and the UK all had vested interests in Libya's natural resources. Emails from the Hillary Clinton leaks revealed that the General Directorate for External Security, the French intelligence service, had been meeting with former Libyan ministers of justice and the interior, both of whom had left the Gaddafi government and requested the aid of the French in his overthrow. According to the memo, the French agreed, but in return for their assistance, the DGSE officers indicated that they expected the new government of Libya to favor French firms and national interests, particularly regarding the oil industry in Libya. Specifically, the French government requested the rebels set aside 35% of the nation's oil and gas for France in exchange for assistance and recognition of the new government. Ultimately, Gaddafi was overthrown. Violently, to put it mildly, because I don't know if YouTube would even let me say how exactly he died, but let's just say it involved the business end of a bayonet, and unrest has remained present in Libya ever since, surely to the chagrin of those foreign entities that sought to profit from the nation sans its leader. In March of 2014, in an address to the state Duma deputies, Putin reflected on the similarities between the color revolutions of the former Soviet states in the 2000s and the Arab Spring, stating that, quote, it is clear that people in those countries where those events took place are tired of tyranny, of poverty, of the lack of prospects, but those feelings were simply cynically used, alluding to the interference of external forces in those events. Once again, I cannot say for sure what Putin meant, but in her analysis of the color revolutions in comparison to the Arab Spring, professor of world politics and research fellow at the Center for Post-Soviet Studies at the Moscow State University of International Relations, Yulia Nikitina, stated that, from Putin's perspective, quote, Without outside interference, a disconnected populace would have chosen a different, more legitimate, more constitutional means of expressing its discontent in Libya. But Putin's concerns made in his 2014 speech were not based only on the Arab Spring and the color revolutions of the 2000s, but also on the recent events that occurred in Ukraine beginning in late 2013, when in November of that year, a series of protests against Yanukovych, known as the Euromaidan, spread across the country. Following Yanukovych's decision to not sign the European Union-Ukraine Association Agreement and instead choosing to focus on strengthening ties with Russia. These protests would lead to serious changes in the country. So let's shift our attention to Ukraine during and after the Euromaidan. It is possible that much as with the discussions between the Arab Spring leaders and the French intelligence that occurred behind the scenes before military intervention of NATO that aided in Gaddafi's fall, that other background events occurred as precursors to the Euromaidan protests. And one of surely countless precipitating events that was arguably far more benign than others were the tech camps held in Kiev, funded predominantly by the US State Department directly preceding it. While the State Department has removed their web pages discussing the tech camps, making it difficult to determine exactly how many of these had been held, the most recent before the Euromaidan protests occurred between November 14th and 15th, just a week beforehand in Kiev. According to the State Department, the purpose of these camps was for participants to learn, quote, how to put together effective social media engagement campaigns to mobilize youth action, develop a working knowledge of new technologies easily, learning on the spot how to effectively tell a story using online video, relay a message using blogging or podcasting, and use online sharing resources to provide education across distances. Of course, nothing in this description sounds inherently negative, and I would not contend that there was anything really seditious being taught in these camps, as I have no evidence to make such an assertion. However, it is a curious coincidence that within a week of the most recent tech camp in Kiev, that many of the skills taught by the State Department's own words were put into use by the Euromaidan protesters in spreading their message via social media and in the form of viral videos, such as this one titled, I am a Ukrainian, which made the rounds online. the Ukrainian, the native of Kyiv, and now I am on Maidan, on the central part of my city. I want you to know why thousands of people all over my country are on the streets. 
There is only one reason. We want to be free from a dictatorship. We want to be free from the politicians who work only for themselves, who are ready to shoot, to beat, to injure people just for saving their money, just for saving their houses, just to saving their power. I want these people who are here, who have dignity, who are brave, I want them to live a normal life. We are civilized people, but our governments are barbarians. That's not a Soviet Union. We want our courts not to be corrupted. We want to be free. I know that maybe tomorrow we will have no phone, no internet connection, and we will be alone here. And maybe policemen will murder us one after another when it will be dark here. That's why I ask you now to help us. We have this freedom inside, inside our hearts. We have this freedom in our minds. And now I ask you to build this freedom in our country. You can help us only by telling this story to your friends, only by sharing this video. Please share, share it. Speak to your friends, speak to your family, speak to your government and show that you support us. The viral video in question, clearly intended to tug on our heartstrings, was produced in association with a documentary called Whisper to a Roar, which was sponsored by numerous international NGOs and produced by Larry Diamond, who has served as an advisor for the U.S. Department of State, the United Nations, the World Bank, the U.S. Agency for International Development, and is a co-founding editor of the National Endowment for Democracies, NED, again told you the acronym would come back, Journal for Democracy, one of the NGOs that funded the Whisper to a Roar. The NED also receives more than 93% of its funding from the State Department, and their financial records are indicative that the organization spent more than $22 million in Ukraine since 2014 under the auspices of spreading democracy. Which, if anyone has ever lived in a country that America has talked about spreading democracy to over the last hundred years, should raise some red flags. It is perhaps because of the involvement of groups like the NED that Deputy Oleg Sarov, just weeks before the Euromadan protests erupted, made a statement to the Ukrainian government that the tech camps were designed to interfere with the nation's sovereignty. As the Euromaidan protests waged throughout November of 2013, other groups responded to the action, with the far-right paramilitary organization Right Sector being formed by Dmitry Yarosh and Andrei Tarashenko in association with the UNA, UNSO, another political paramilitary organization previously described. Outside of Ukraine, the U.S. also turned its attention far more publicly to the nation, with the Obama administration's Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs, Victoria Nuland, told you she'd be back too, making three trips to Ukraine over the course of five weeks between November and December. During this time, Nuland met with several Ukrainian political figures, including Oletia Hanibuk, again, a name I will ask you to keep in mind once more, albeit only for a few more moments. At an international business conference on December 13th, Newland said that the U.S. had spent $5 billion in democracy projects in Ukraine by that point. Since Ukraine's independence in 1991, the United States has supported Ukrainians as they build democratic skills and institutions, as they promote civic participation and good governance, all of which are preconditions for Ukraine to achieve its European aspirations. We've invested over $5 billion to assist Ukraine in these and other goals that will ensure a secure and prosperous and democratic Ukraine. According to a report from March of 2014 from U.S. defense contractor Scott Rickard, at least part of that money had been used to fund the Orange Revolution in 2004, although there's no hard proof of that claim. A lot of uh, um, activity uh, going on that was, you know, being supported by the outside, by the West. You know, the West has invested over $5 billion in the U.S. government alone. And Newland was not the only person in the U.S. government invested in the protests as John McCain also made an appearance, never a good sign, in the Euromaidan and met with various political leaders as well, including Arseniy Yatsenyuk and Oletia Hanibuk. It's important to note that Russia was also still interested, at least at this point, in investing money in Ukraine, much as was the United States. As Putin offered Ukraine 15 billion in loans to bail out its failing economy, plus a plan for reduced gas prices, equaling a $22 billion deal in December of 2013. Although Yanukovych likely would have taken this deal, he would never get an opportunity to. While the Euromaidan protests continued, on February 4th of 2014, a phone call between Newland and U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine Jeffrey Piat was leaked, although the date of recording is unknown. 
In this call, the two discussed three potential candidates to replace Yanukovych, who was still very much president at the time, those being Arseniy Yatsenyuk, Vitaly Klitschko, and Ola Tiahanibuk. Newland and Piat were unfavorable towards Klitschko, preferring him to remain mayor of Kiev, and expressed that they thought Ola Tiahanibuk was also undesirable. So, uh, I don't think Klitsch should go into the government. I don't think it's necessary. I don't think it's a good idea. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess... You think... what In terms of him not going into the government, just let him sort of stay out and do his political homework and stuff. I'm just thinking, in terms of sort of the process moving ahead, we want to keep the moderate Democrats together. The problem is going to be Tony Book and his guys. And, you know, I'm sure that's part of what Yanukovych is calculating on all of this. Both parties expressed that Yats was the best candidate and that they would talk to him more going forward. I think Yats is the guy who's got the economic experience, the governing experience. He's, he's the guy, you know, what he needs is Cleach and Tony Book on the outside. He needs to be talking to them four times a week, you know. I, I just think Kleech going in, he's going to be at that level working for Yatsenyuk. It's just not going to work. Yeah, no, I think that's, I think that's right. Okay. Good. Well, do you want us to try to set up a call with him as the next step? My understanding from that call, but you tell me, was that the big three were going into their own meeting and that Yats was going to offer in that context a, a three-way, you know, a three plus one conversation or three plus two with you. Is that not how you understood it? No, I think, I mean, that's what he proposed, but I think just knowing the dynamic that's been with them where um, Klitschko has been the top dog, he's going to take a while to show up for whatever meeting they've got, and he's probably talking to his guys at this point. So I think you reaching out directly to him helps with the personality management among the three, and it, and it gives you also a chance to move fast on all this stuff and put us behind it, behind it before they all sit down and he, um, he explains why he doesn't like it. Okay, good. I'm happy. Why don't you reach out to him and see if he wants to talk before or after? At this point, it's probably important that we finally talk about the third major contender for power in Ukraine whose name has come up so often, Tia Hanibuk. Ola became a national sensation in 2009 when the Freedom Party he ran under obtained 34.69% nice, of the votes and 50 seats out of the 120 in the Ternopil Regional Council, while its nearest competitor, the United Center, gained only 14% of the vote. But that's not where his political career began. Before 2004, the Freedom Party was known as the Social National Party of Ukraine, or SNPU, and as previously mentioned, its official symbol was the wolf spangle. In 1995, SNPU leaders stated, quote, In view of the prospect of mass degradation of people and entire nations, we are the last hope of the white race, of the humankind as such. We must resolutely separate ourselves from the northeastern neighbor, referring to Russia, not only because it is aggressive and can grab us, but, first of all, because it brings into our life the psychology of our peoples, qualities which are different from European values. In other words, they were pro-EU white supremacists, which considering that Germany is in charge of the EU is just a bit of a frightening prospect. Straight out of Compton, crazy mother f named Ice Cube, from the gang called Fellas with Attitudes. When I'm called off, I got a sword off, squeeze the trigger and bodies are hauled off. In 1998, Tia Honeybook became leader of the SNPU in Kiev, and won a parliamentary seat that year and again in 2002. In 2004, he would resign from his seat to instead serve as head of the party in an attempt to improve its image publicly. Yet despite these attempts, his beliefs at the time seemingly remained consistent, as in a 2004 speech he said, quote, The enemy came and took their Ukraine, referring to the Ukrainian insurgent army. But they were not afraid. Likewise, we must not be afraid. They took their automatic guns on their necks and went into the woods. They got them ready and fought against the Moskali, Germans, Zhidi, meaning Jews, and other scum who wanted to take away our Ukrainian state. And therefore our task, for every one of you, the young, the old, the grey-headed, and the youthful, we must defend our native land. These young men and you, the grey-headed, are the very combination which the Moskal Kosidizya, the Jewish-Russian mafia ruling in Ukraine, fears the most. In summer of 2004, 12 years before the death of our Lord Harambe, the public prosecutor's office in the Ivano Frankisk opened a criminal case against Yohannibuk on charges of inciting ethnic hatred, certainly a very specific crime and likely based on well-exercised laws, much like Germany and Britain's laws against drunkenness or Montenegrin laws against public indecency. That last one I just made up. I mean, Montenegro, not the law. But it didn't really matter as these charges were dropped the next year. He opposed the introduction of Russian as a second state language and requested that the OUN and UPA be officially recognized by the government for their role in World War II in 2005. 
although none of these ideas were adopted. In that same year, he demanded the Supreme Court, quote, stop the criminal activity of the organized jewelry. Wait a minute, that doesn't sound right. Steven Universe wouldn't come out for at least another 10 years. Oh, hang on, that's not organized jewelry. But, uh, either way, he believed it posed a threat to Ukrainian sovereignty. Although he and his party struggled to see much success in the elections during the 2000s, in 2009, Tia Honeybook's associates secured 50 seats out of 120 in the Ternopil Regional Council elections. However, he failed to excel in the 2010 national election, wherein nationalist voters favored the more mainstream candidate, Yushchenko, with Tia Honeybook attributing some of the party's losses to Timoshenko, who, according to him, was friends with, quote, Russian czars, even though she was actually favorable towards the EU. Regardless of the lack of mainstream political success seen by Tia Honeybook, it seemed that the United States politicians and political forces took an interest in him nonetheless, considering the meetings between himself and both Victoria Newland and John McCain in 2014. While, as Newland described in her call with Piat, the U.S. did not favor Tia Honeybook as a candidate to serve as PM, she did seemingly see him as relevant, and given his anti-Russian, heavy nationalistic sentiments, that perception was likely not unwarranted during the Euromaidan. And returning to the subject of the Euromaidan and the removal of Yanukovych as president, after months of protests, the violence escalated in February of 2014 as both pro-Russia and pro-Ukraine protesters were killed by snipers in the streets of Kiev. This violence shocked outsiders and Ukrainians alike, as a leaked call between Estonia's foreign minister, Ermes Pate, and the EU's foreign affairs chief, Catherine Ashton, from late 2014 illustrates. Despite their disgust, however, they also make clear in their conversation that they were under the impression that the snipers were not under the command of then-still-President Yanukovych, but instead... Uh, the people who were killed by snipers from both sides, among policemen and, and people from the streets, that they were the same snipers killing people from both sides. Well, that, yeah. And that this information had been conferred to them based on the findings of Dr. Olga Bolgometz. And then she also showed me some photos. Uh, she said that as medical doctor, she can, you know, say that it is the same, same handwriting, the same type of bullets. And it's really disturbing that now the new, uh, new coalition, that they don't want to investigate what exactly happened, so that there is now stronger and stronger understanding that behind snipers, they were, it was not Yanukovych, but it was somebody from the new coalition. It is important to note that Bolgometz did not appear to be fond of the Yanukovych regime, as she not only personally participated in the Euromaidan protests, but encouraged her students to as well. While it has been reported by some in the West that Bolgometz is not a proper medical doctor and instead a cosmetologist, this is incorrect as Dr. Bolgometz holds a degree in general medicine and a medical degree in skin and venereal diseases. She merely founded the Bolgometz Institute of Dermatology and Cosmetology. Perhaps some of that information just got lost in translation, but yes, she is very much a doctor, and of all things, a doctor who specializes in venereal diseases in East Europe. That's a pretty serious job. She also had previously served as the personal physician of President Yushchenko. As such, it's unlikely that she, either as a medical professional or a supporter of the Euromaidan or as the personal doctor of rival Yushchenko, was motivated to lie to Peyton Ashton about her analysis of the bullets as not being attributable to the Yushchenko regime. Unless Ukrainian presidents go about selecting their physicians New Vegas style, I doubt her credentials are in question. And given she was born in Ukraine during the Soviet era, there's no way she has the natural nine luck needed to operate without medical knowledge. I'm pretty sure they kicked anyone with a luck above three out of the Soviet bloc entirely. And speaking of that regime, it ended shortly after the escalation of the violence as Yanukovych fled the country for Russia on February 22nd after refusing to resign. That same day, Alexander Turchinov was appointed first as prime minister but then as president and assumed control of the armed forces, with Arseny Yatsenyuk, the guy preferred by Nuland and Piat, assuming the role of PM. The mayor of Kiev, Vitaly Klitschko, had withdrawn from his run for the office of president just a few weeks after Newland and Piet suggested that he should. Purely by coincidence, I'm sure. What a coincidence! Turchinov's party at the time was Fatherland, a pro-EU, pro-NATO party, but he formed a new party, the People's Front, shortly afterwards in March. Yats, in turn, the favorite of the U.S., had served as first deputy chairman of the Ukrainian National Bank since 2003 and was favorable towards the EU and NATO while generally disfavoring the Russians. This new temporary government also involved members of more extremist elements of Ukrainian politics, including three Svoboda ministers, Deputy Prime Minister Oleksandr Sitch, no relation, Agrarian Policy and Food Minister Ihor Svaika, and Environment and Natural Resources Minister Andriy Molknik. 
Following the Euromaidan and deposal of Yanukovych, referred to some by a coup and by others as the Revolution of Dignity, certainly no framing there, pro-Russian protesters in Crimea began gathering to show distrust and distaste with the events in Kiev, with many demanding Crimea be annexed by Russia due to perceptions that the new Ukrainian government had been corrupted by Western influence and would be explicitly anti-Russian, an issue for Crimeans as they are largely ethnic Russians. The day after the protests in Crimea began, the government released all political prisoners, including Andriy Belitsky, commander of the Azov Battalion and leader of the Social National Assembly, or SNA. The stated goals of the SNA that Belitsky co-founded are, quote, the protection of the white race by creating an anti-democratic and anti-capitalist nationocracy system and the eradication of the international Zionist speculative capital. In 2010, Belitsky said that it was the Ukrainian national mission to, quote, lead the white races of the world in a final crusade against the Semite-led Untermenschen. The SNA was further described by Anton Sekostov, an academic who studies the radical right in Europe, as, quote, a neo-Nazi movement which has always been too extreme for the right sector. According to its official documents, its nationalism is racial, social, great power imperialist, anti-systemic, meaning anti-democratic and anti-capitalist, self-sufficient, militant, and uncompromising. Its ideology builds on maximalist attitudes, national and racial egoism, while glorifying the Ukraine nation as part of the white race. I do want to be clear, having just said all of that, that just because there are legitimate armed neo-Nazi movements in Ukraine does not in any way legitimize Putin's claims that the 2022 Russian military invasion was really for the purpose of denazifying the country. That's nothing more than political optics. However, it would also be disingenuous of me, or for anyone covering this topic, to assert that there is no far-right neo-Nazi movements that have had any influence over Ukrainian politics since the Euromaidan and going far back into Ukrainian history, as we looked at earlier. If nothing else, it is interesting that Beletsky is the kind of person who was released immediately after the overthrow of the more pro-Russian Yanukovych regime, but all political prisoners were released, so who can really say for sure? The interim government under Turchinov and Yats also established the Lustration Committee to remove the Yanukovych-era politicians and civil servants in February, just days after coming into power. On February 28th, Joe Biden, then vice president, personally called Yats to congratulate him on his new position, an act that Newland specifically said that Biden should do following the overthrow of Yanukovych. Well, at least for once, Biden managed to not botch an international mission. Then again, it probably helps that his son Hunter may have had that number handy, but we'll get more into that soon. On the same day, February 28th, the fears of the protesters in Crimea began to take shape, as Parliament voted to remove laws protecting the use of Russian, Romanian, and Hungarian languages in regions where they were spoken by the majority, which included Crimea and the eastern Donbass region. Just days later, on March 1st, Ukrainian stations were required to cease broadcast of Russian-language channels. Simultaneously, more Ukrainian nationalists were placed into positions of power in the interim government, with Poltava, Ternopil, and Rivne Oblast governors, and Svoboda members, Viktor Bohaychuk, Ole Sirotyuk, and Sergei Rybachka, all being appointed in early March. On the 4th of that month, John Kerry met with Vitaly Klitschko, Ola Tiahanibuk, and the future president, Petro Poroshenko, to present an offer of $1 billion in loans to the nation, contingent on making changes Washington wanted to see in the country, changes that really weren't publicly specified. On the same day, Putin rescinded Russia's previous $22 billion deal, likely seeing the writing on the wall for the future of Ukrainian politics moving favorably towards the West politically, regardless of any real economic concerns. The removal of their offer was not the only sign that Russia no longer believed Ukraine was a state acting independent of Western influence, as between February and March, following the protests in Crimea, Russian forces took the region with almost no bloodshed. This was possible because Russia was already leasing land for army bases in the area. While it's questionable that any voting that occurs in a region having just been captured by a foreign military force can be conducted without duress, it is worth noting that the residents of Crimea did technically vote to secede from Ukraine on March 14th. Although, as previously mentioned, the legitimacy of such a vote is suspect at best, and U.S. Secretary of State Tony Blinken decried the vote as illegitimate. Reasonably so, although arguably somewhat hypocritically, given the United States' own financial investments in influencing Ukrainian politics. As in the same month, Nicole Thompson, a State Department spokeswoman, confirmed the information from Newland's talk. Thompson specified that the funding was on governing justly and democratically, $800 million, investing in people, $400 million, economic growth, $1.1 billion, and humanitarian assistance, $300 million, whatever the hell all of that exactly is supposed to mean. 
It seemed that the West more broadly was pleased with the overthrow of the Yanukovych government beyond the financial deals and personal phone calls from the vice president, as on March 21st, the European Union-Ukraine Association Agreement was provisionally signed, placing Ukraine into a kind of limbo of EU membership, similarly to the limbo membership it had long held with NATO. Also in late March, the interim leaders Turchinov and Yatsenyuk founded the People's Front Party, making newly released Andrei Beletsky again a founding member of the Azov Battalion, part of the Military Council. As such, it doesn't just seem as though the release of Beletsky from prison just two days after the formation of the interim government was completely happenstance. In response to Russia's invasion of Crimea on April 1st, the NATO foreign ministers agreed to cease all cooperation with Russia. And thus, if there ever really was any chance of partnership between the two, as had been repeatedly discussed in the 90s, the invasion of Crimea appeared to be the end of any such potentiality, at least any time in the foreseeable future. Rather than be discouraged by international condemnation, less than two weeks later, pro-Russian protesters in the eastern region of Donetsk, which has a largely ethnic Russian populace, joined with similar protest as the largely ethnic Russian region of Crimea, seizing a city office and setting off the war in the Donbass, followed shortly by similar actions in the nearby Luhansk region. In the same month, over in America, now having a government favored by the U.S. in place in Ukraine, Vice President Biden met with his son Hunter's business partner, Devon Archer, at the White House, and just days later, on April 21st, the VP flew to Ukraine to serve as the Obama administration's public face in the nation. This surely was only because Barry knew that if there was anything untoward going on in Ukraine, Biden was the man to sniff it out. The very next day, Devon joined the board of Ukrainian energy company Burisma. In the next week, on April 28th, British officials seized 23 million from the London bank accounts of Burisma's owner, Mykola Zlochevsky, who had served as deputy secretary on the National Security and Defense Council under Yanukovych's government, which again had just been deposed. This money would not be returned to Zlochevsky until 2015. Meanwhile, just days later, back in 2014, Hunter Biden also joined the board of Burisma on May 12th, for which he was paid up to $83,000 a month for his services which would place his income at about 83 times the average gross income per capita in Ukraine in 2015. And those services? Well, according to leaked emails between company executive and advisor to the board of Burisma, Vadim Buzarsky, Archer and Hunter were there to use their influence and connections in Washington to improve the company's image, specifically the image of, quote, NZ, in the email, which likely was in reference to Zlochevsky. Because everyone knows nothing says good PR like Hunter Biden. Meanwhile, protests began in Odessa in early May, with both pro-Russia and pro-Ukrainian activists involved, and much like the Euromaidan, unfortunately, also experienced violence, as at least 112 people died during the event, 42 in a single firebombing suspected to have been set by right-sector activists. Despite the ongoing upheaval on May 7th, Vladimir Putin stated that he was hopeful for the future of Ukraine following the upcoming election later that month on the 25th which resulted in the selection of Petro Poroshenko, who in turn selected, again, Newland's guy, Arsene Yatsenyuk as PM, as approved by Parliament in October. Given that both regions were either in the process of attempt at secession or had already been occupied by Russia, neither Crimea nor Donbass, predominantly ethnic Russian regions, participated in the May election. Although the Russians had rescinded their $22 billion deal earlier in the year and had also increased the cost on another outstanding deal to reduce gas prices to Kiev, Following the removal of Yanukovych in February, Yatsenyuk declined to accept the remnants of the offer in June, seemingly only for political reasons and illustrating a downward turn for energy relations between the two countries. This trend would only continue into 2015 when the Ukrainian government increased their tariffs on Russian natural gas run through the country by 50% and made plans to further increase the price by 2018, certainly in part incentivizing the construction of the Nord Stream pipelines that allow Russian natural gas, which constitutes about half of all of Europe's supply, to be transported directly into Germany, circumventing Ukraine and its tariffs altogether, following the completion of Nord Stream 2 and the cessation of existing contracts by 2025. Estimates have placed the cost of building and maintaining pipelines under the Baltic Sea as being up to 50% cheaper than transit through Ukraine at this point, which Russia had historically charged less for natural gas than other trading partners such as Poland, following the implementation of these tariffs. To simplify, Russia was giving Ukraine a really good deal on energy, and the post-Euromaidan government basically told them to go pound rocks, entirely to their own detriment, none of which makes any sense for a nation acting in its own best interest. On the subject of natural gas, though, the post-revolution, fairly openly anti-Russian government essentially tanked a major source of national income, a 
about 1.2 billion per annum and cause their own costs to import Russian gas to soar simply by charging too much for the usage of the old Soviet pipeline and for no apparent reason beyond what one could guess, either greed or spite or just hoping the Americans would pick up the financial slack. Back in August of 2014, that new president who would end up bungling the gas trade, Poroshenko, dissolved the parliament, arguably to rid it of corruption or remaining elements from the previous Yanukovych government. On September 5th, Poroshenko signed a ceasefire in the Donbass. However, much as with the rejection of a profitable energy deal, it seemed the new government held a deep animosity towards Russia and ethnic Russians in Ukraine, as the government would violate that ceasefire over a hundred thousand times, and no, that's not an exaggeration, over the next few years. The rationale for these violations consistently was that Russian troops were operating in the region. However, in January of 2015, Chief of Staff Viktor Mushenko admitted in a news briefing that Russian troops actually had not been taking part in combat operations in Donbass, meaning the military interventions on the part of the Ukrainian government had been committed against their own civilians, not Russians, and meaning the government was seemingly targeting the region's ethnic Russians and thereby the ongoing violence could potentially be described as an attempt at ethnic cleansing on civilians. Despite the military action, in April, pro-Russian forces captured public offices in the Donbass, eventually declaring themselves the Donetsk People's Republic and Luhansk People's Republic. Putin would later recognize these states as sovereign in February of 2022. Back in 2015, however, in April, Vadim Buzarsky, again the senior executive at Burisma, sent an email to Hunter Biden, thanking him for inviting him to DC to meet with his father Joe Biden, and requested further meetings with Hunter. In turn, in May, Hunter emailed Deputy Secretary of State Tony Blinken, requesting the two meet up as well, and presumably they did. In September, U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine and the man who was casually discussing who should replace Yanukovych, Jeffrey Piat, publicly called for the Prosecutor General's office, led by Viktor Shokin, to further pursue an investigation into Burisma President Slochevsky, indicating that he believed the investigation that was already ongoing was being intentionally stymied. But around this same time, eyebrows elsewhere in the U.S. government started being raised concerning potential corruption in Ukraine, as in October, State Department official Amos Horstein expressed worryment with the dealings of the vice president in Ukraine and specifically Hunter Biden's position on Burisma's board, stating the association enabled Russian disinformation efforts and risked undermining U.S. policy in Ukraine. Despite the fact that Hunter's entire purpose on the board, at least according to the internal emails, was to bolster the public image of Burisma, the attention he brought clearly wasn't working as intended. As in October, Blue Star Strategies, an international government relations firm, was hired by Burisma to also help boost their image in response specifically to public criticism of Hunter's position on the board, which had basically been a total backfire. Pozarski, in an email to Blue Star, expressed concerns that their initial pitch to improve the company's image did not explicitly include plans to improve Zlochevsky's image with the U.S. and Ukrainian officials. The same thing he had seemingly asked Hunter and Archer to do in previous emails. Around this same time, Right Sector was largely disbanded, with its leaders believing that it had, quote, done its job as a revolutionary structure and was no longer needed. Yeah, probably not a great sign when a white nationalist organization looks at your country's government and says, our work here is done. Does this mean you're- One of Right Sector's key founders, Dmitry Yarosh, said he didn't support continued revolutionary rhetoric and didn't want to push anything that might weaken or question the current Ukrainian government's hold on power. Despite the group being disbanded, many of its members would go on to join Azov Battalion, again a far-right group led by Andrei Beletsky, that uses symbols also used by the Nazis, including the Black Sun or Soninrad, and the Wolf Spangl. However, in June of 2015, the U.S. Congress passed a resolution to prohibit the further use of U.S. government resources to fund, provide arms, training, or other assistance to the battalion, of course implying that they had been doing so up until then kind of the white nationalist equivalent of what do you mean, you people. In a 2014 report from the BBC, the news outlet claimed that Azov was also being funded by Ukraine's Interior Ministry, a claim that was not directly denied by a Ukrainian ministerial advisor, Anton Goroshenko, who instead responded to questions about the group by saying that Azov is, quote, a party of Ukrainian patriots who are giving their lives while the rich Europeans are only talking about supporting Ukraine. When, may I ask, will English people come here and help us fight terrorists sent by Russia's President Putin, instead of lecturing us on our moral values or people's political affiliations? So, in other words, his response to accusations of the government funding a militarized neo-Nazi paramilitary organization was not to deny it, but to ask where the West's child support was. 
Hello, sir. This is the United Bank of Money. In early July of 2015, in an interview with the Daily Beast, Sergeant Ivan Karkiv of Azov spoke about the battalion's experience with U.S. trainers and U.S. volunteers quite fondly, even mentioning that the U.S. volunteers and engineers and medics were still currently assisting them. Although it's difficult to determine if this interview occurred before or after Congress barred support of the group specifically. Ultimately, the suspension of funding mattered little, as in January of 2016, Congress lifted the ban on funding Azov anyway. Well, good job, America. We managed to go a whole six months without funding a legitimate violent neo-Nazi paramilitary organization in a foreign country. I'm so proud of my homeland. If the back and forth on the decision to fund Azov seems capricious and erratic, don't worry, it got worse. As in October of the exact same year, the UN accused Azov of war crimes. At the end of the year, in December of 2015, Vice President Joe Biden himself made an appearance at the Ukrainian Rada to show his support for the Euromaidan, which he referred to as the Revolution of Dignity, decry the annexation of Crimea, whose recent election he described as illegal, and promising harsh sanctions on Russia. It was not just Russia that Biden criticized, as he also made mention of corruption within Ukraine, specifically bringing up the General Prosecutor's Office, although he refrained from mentioning Shokin by name. He further reaffirmed that the U.S. had promised $2 billion in loan guarantees to Ukraine, those exact same loans that were withheld had Shokin not been removed, plus $260 million in U.S. assistance to help strengthen the Ukrainian democracy, with a promise for more money so long as Ukraine, quote, keeps moving forward, presumably away from that alleged corruption. Speaking of corruption, in late February of 2016, Burisma representatives set up a March 1st meeting with Under Secretary of State Catherine Novelli via email to dismiss the allegations of corruption and specifically named Hunter Biden and Karen Tramontero, a lawyer working for Blue Star Strategies, which was consulting for Burisma as persons of interest to the discussion. Less than a month after this meeting on March 29th, the Ukrainian parliament dismissed Prosecutor General Viktor Shokin, who had been investigating Burisma and Zlochevsky. Although the exact date is unclear, around this time, Vice President Biden threatened to withhold $1 billion in loan guarantees to Poroshenko and Yatsenyuk's government if they did not fire Shokin, and he was in fact dismissed from his post on March 29th, an act Biden would later in 2018 reminisce upon fondly in a manner much akin to Hillary Clinton's classic joviality as she herself recalled how As we came, we saw, <laughs> he died. <laughs> said, you have no authority, you're not the president. The president said, I said, call him. <laughs> I said, I'm telling you, you're not getting a billion dollars. I said, you're not getting a billion, I'm gonna be leaving here, and I think it was, what, six hours? I looked, I said, I'm leaving in six hours. If the prosecutor's not fired, you're not getting the money. Well, son of a bitch, <laughs> got fired. And they put in place someone who was solid. Ah, the little things that bring joy to American politicians. And on the topic of the Clintons, always a dangerous way to start a sentence, also in March, Karen Tramontero and Sally Painter, both of whom had worked in the Clinton administration, along with former U.S. Deputy Assistant Attorney General John Beretta, all representing Blue Star Strategies, again, that firm that Burisma hired to repair their image after the hiring of Hunter Biden had the opposite of its intended effect, met with representatives in the Prosecutor General's office to apologize for the dissemination of misinformation concerning Shokin and his investigation into Zlochevsky, misinformation which they described as having been perpetrated by U.S. public figures. No such apology was made to Shokin himself, though, and his investigation into Burisma was announced by the company and Zlochevsky as having been completely closed by February of 2017. Zlochevsky was legally represented by none other than John Beretta, again, the former deputy attorney general turned representative of Burisma affiliated public relations group Blue Star Strategies. There are more people in the average chamber play than there are in this story. But just to quickly reiterate the highlights of the entire debacle then, Ukraine's lead prosecutor had been investigating energy firm Burisma for years due to allegations of corruption. Within months of Joe Biden's son, Hunter, being hired to its board, making over 80 grand a month, for the purpose of using his connections to improve its image, that prosecutor was fired as part of the open quid pro quo exchange for a billion dollars in U.S. aid to be provided to the government by none other than his father, Joe Biden. And in the exact same month in which he was fired, representatives of a PR firm working for that exact same company apologized to other members of the prosecutor's office for having lied about their organization. And within a year, all charges against the company were dropped. But of course, that's all just a bunch of coincidences, 
and not at all now confirmed by the New York Times. So let's just move on to Ukraine post-revolution and after the main events of the Hunter Biden scandal. The next major event of interest in understanding the political situation in Ukraine leading up to the 2022 invasion is likely going to be the April 2019 election of Volodymyr Zelensky, who ran under his new Servant of the People party, winning 70% of the vote. And with Poroshenko bloc representative Volodymyr Grozman serving as his PM, Zelensky is an interesting figure to say the least, being an actor and having appeared in some, well, let's just say unique works of art. Yeah, that's a real thing and not just an Ali G joke. Dance for me, bitch. Also, a quite interesting element of his thespian resume outside of um, what we just watched, and what I find personally most interesting was his leading role in the 2015 Kvartel 95 TV show, Servant of the People. Hey, that's the name of the political party, where he starred as humble schoolteacher Vasil Holoborodko, who is secretly recorded by one of his students conducting an impassioned rant about corruption in the Ukrainian government. The video goes viral and Holoborodko is elected president based purely on public support for his words. This heroic triumph of the everyman over corrupt politicians occurs despite an extra-governmental attempt to rig the election by a cabal of faceless elites. I, I mean in the TV show. Everything I just described was nothing more than the plot of a light-hearted Ukrainian comedy series from 2015. Hello, my congratulations. We decided to take your country to the European Union. Oh fuck! Oh, I, I'm sorry, oh wow! Oh, <laughs> oh you know, I'm so happy. Yes. Oh, oh and, uh, thank you very much, all the uh, Ukrainians and uh, all of our country. Oh, we've been waiting for this so much time. Ukrainians? Yes, Ukrainians. Oh, I'm so sorry, that's a mistake. I was calling to Montenegro. Also, there's a scene where he guns down the entire Ukrainian parliament. Zelensky appears incapable of not ripping off Western media, as that too was just a recreation of a scene from The Simpsons. All in favor, say die. <laughs> After Zelensky's real election, however, it appears that the US was once again willing to spend a significant chunk of change on Ukraine, with the Department of Defense donating $250 million to the country in June of 2019, shortly after Zelensky's presidential win. In the next month, Trump and Zelensky had a phone call. And not just any kind of normal phone conversation, no, this phone call would go on to become the focus of an impeachment inquiry by the US Congress into abuses of power and obstruction of justice after a US government whistleblower expressed concern about Trump's alleged effort to enlist Zelensky into an investigation of the Biden's relationship to the firing of prosecutor Viktor Shokin. Yeah, recall that the entire controversy here was Trump asking the president of Ukraine to look into some shady business? Not the shady business itself having happened. Which again, now, thanks to the New York Times finally admitting to it, we do have confirmation that it did occur. Now, we don't have time to go over the full contents of the call, but suffice to say, it could be best described as what political scientists refer to technically as a wee-wee suck on the part of Zelensky, with Trump casually encouraging him to look into the entire Shokin affair. Zelensky can act confused all he wants on stage sitting next to the orange man, but the tone of the phone call is classic wee-wee suck. I ain't had my wee-wee suck properly in a few months. Where's my vacuum mouth veteran whore? Also, if you do get the time, again, I highly suggest reading the entire phone call, as it is Trump being really, really unapologetically Trump. And ultimately, Trump was not successfully impeached as a result of this event, However, again, it is important to remember that the first time the US government sought to impeach Donald Trump, it was in response to him asking the president of Ukraine to look into the former vice president of the US's son being made a board member on a Ukrainian energy company whose owner was being investigated for fraud, and then mere months later, the man investigating said company was fired, the investigation dropped, and then the former vice president bragged about how he made that firing happen in exchange for a billion dollars in US subsidies. But again, remember, it was Trump who had betrayed his sacred oath of office there in that call by asking Zelensky to maybe check out what was going on. 
On that subject of the onus of Trump's impeachment, though, several months later, in September of 2019, Victor Shokin sent a sworn witness affidavit to the lawyers of Dimitro Firtash and the Austrian courts, in which he claimed that Poroshenko asked him to resign at the behest of Joe Biden, threatening to withhold that $1 billion in subsidies. In 2015, Ukraine's internal affairs minister, Arsen Avakov, announced that after consulting with U.S. officials, he had instructed the Ukrainian police to detain Firtash, a pro-Russian businessman with deep ties to Russia, should he attempt to re-enter Ukraine, having previously fled the country to Vienna. Fast forward back to 2019, the General Prosecutor's Office confirmed that Shokin had been investigating Burisma since before Hunter Biden joined the board, although his investigation only became a subject of concern once Hunter had joined. Convenient that. It seemed that, at the time, perhaps despite Joe Biden's billion-dollar best attempt to silence the investigation into Burisma, people were starting to ask questions. As in November of 2019, Chairman Grassley and Chairman Johnson wrote a letter to the Department of State expressing issues with potential conflicts of interest due to Hunter Biden's position on the board of Burisma. They were surely not the only ones interested, as in June of 2020, Ukraine's National Anti-Corruption Bureau reported that their office had been offered a $6 million bribe, specifically offered in USD, to cease investigation into Zlochevsky. Burisma denied any involvement with the offer. They weren't the only ones to start denying things. What is it with Ukrainians denying six million, by the way? As in August, Tran Montano testified to the Senate that she didn't know Hunter Biden was involved in Burismo when Blue Star Strategies began consulting for them. Of course, much like Gorbachev insisting that NATO expansion was never discussed in any of his many meetings with Western leaders, leaked documents would betray Tran Montano's statement to the Senate as not quite accurate. In 2014, Tran Montano sent an email thanking Hunter for traveling to New York City to meet with Latvian banker Valery Belikon, and expressed intentions to reconnect with him soon, which presumably they did. As by October of that year, Sally Painter, also from Blue Star Strategies, referred to him in another email as a great friend. So it's just a bit hard to believe that Tran Montano had no clue that her co-worker's great friend, whom she also had been exchanging regular emails with, was serving on the board of Burisma. Although, for years, the details of these interactions with Hunter Biden were widely claimed to be conspiracy theories, as of 2022, the New York Times, one of the outlets that adamantly described the entire scandal as what else but fake news, was forced to admit that Hunter Biden's laptop that contained the emails was, in fact, real. Just some more convenient timing for that to only be confirmed after the election of his dad to position of leader of the free world. And by the way, it's only because the Grey Lady bothered to admit that the laptop and its contents are not just a conspiracy theory that I've even been able to talk about any of this, because discussion of these emails even just a few weeks ago was still largely banned and silenced on social media outlets. And still on the topic of corruption, as we have been fairly consistently talking about for some time now, some of Zelensky's actions after assuming the office of the president didn't quite line up with the staunchly anti-corruption character that he played on TV. As in March of 2021, he banned three TV stations, IK, News One, and 112 Ukraine, all stations whose news coverage had often been critical of his administration. Just prior to the invasion of Ukraine in January of 2022, hundreds of Ukrainians marched in honor of none other than Bandera, illustrating the enduring nature of much of the nation's fondness for the arguable Nazi collaborator, who was officially, albeit briefly, a national hero. Later that same month, Zelensky threatened to arrest former President Poroshenko if he returned to the country after spending just a month abroad. During his brief absence, Zelensky's government brought more than 120 cases against Poroshenko for corruption. While it could be easily argued that Poroshenko was corrupt, it also just looks a little bit suspect to wait until he leaves on a business trip to file enormous amounts of complaints against him, essentially preventing him from returning to the country except under the threat of arrest. And Poroshenko did return to Ukraine, being allowed to remain in his home until the court proceedings, well, proceeded, despite Zelensky's demand for his arrest and imprisonment on the spot. And with that denial from the courts of Zelensky's call for jail time for his predecessor on January 19th of 2022, that brings us up to the invasion of Ukraine in February, and so to the end of this video. So let's wrap up everything we've learned and come to a few conclusions. In this long video, we took a detailed look at the history of Ukraine, predominantly over the last century, from Soviet state to Nazi occupation, to Soviet state again, to sovereign democratic nation, 
The last hundred years alone have seen countless changes for Ukraine and the Ukrainian people, and many of those changes have been tumultuous and traumatic. To understand why Ukraine was invaded by Russia, however, I do believe it is important to look at the history of those two countries and their relationship since they became independent countries after the fall of the Soviet Union. Even after the end of the Soviet Union, Ukraine has been plagued by controversies and corruption, all while being consistently lied to by foreign leaders who promised them NATO membership, while at the same time promising the Russians that NATO would never expand, when in reality, not only was expansion planned, it seemed that expansion was never intended to actually include Ukraine. US politicians instead have seemed interested in using the nation as their personal playground for playing politics, where they have no right and setting up seedy dealings in Europe with rampant disregard for law and order. Outside of the lies told to his predecessors at the time, as Ukraine became more closely aligned with the West, following some pushing to put it mildly, Russia was lambasted by Western media as having meddled in the United States' own elections, an ironic twist of fate if ever there was one, leaving Russia as once again America's great enemy, as if the Berlin Wall had never fallen. The actions of the West over the last 30 years concerning Russia has made it fairly clear that we never stopped seeing them as the Soviet Union, and for that reason, had no intention to treat Russia as an equal on the world stage. It should come as no surprise, then, that Russia does not trust the US and does not trust NATO. Of course, none of that justifies Russia's invasion of Ukraine, not in the slightest, but I would hope that over the course of this video, I have been able to give you an idea, with a lot of information, and a lot of bad jokes as to how the events in Russia and Ukraine have played out, why the West was involved, and how Russia has justified its invasion. If we are unwilling to understand how one side sees a conflict, then our view of that conflict will inherently be incomplete. Since the invasion began, I have seen a worrying increase in posts and expression of opinions from people who otherwise would normally be skeptical of the US government and particularly the media, now seemingly blindly believing anything they hear and engage in saber-rattling the likes of which would ruffle even John Bolton's mustache. And as such, given I mentioned in the beginning that means a third of Americans are clamoring now for nuclear war over a conflict involving a country most of them had never heard of until 2022, I think there is good reason for these newfound aggressive neocon warhawk attitudes to concern me. I took the time and effort to put together this video and conduct the extensive research it required, not because I'm a fan of Putin and I'm trying to run defense for him. I'm not. But rather because of that premise that there are always two sides to a conflict, and because those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it, and simply because the truth matters. But hey, what do you guys think? Do you think that the West has meddled in the development of Ukraine? And if so, is that even a bad thing? Did Putin invade because he felt boxed into a corner or because he's just an evil would-be dictator Putler man? Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. And while you're down there, if you have enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a like, subscribe if you're not subscribed, and hit the bell so you get updates when I upload a new project, which, as I'm sure you can imagine, takes a while <laughs> to put together. You can also find a link to Magic Spoon in the description and in the pinned comment to get yourself some tasty, guilt-free treats and find other links to support my channel, as well as a link to my relatively new podcast, Broken Crown, if you want to hear me stream every week on the goings-on in the world. If you really liked the video and would like to see your name here with these fine fellows, you can help me out by signing up and supporting me on Patreon or Subscribestar, or buying some merch in my merch store, all linked down in the description. I also do want to apologize for the quality of my voice in this video. I got COVID and I've not really been able to shake the nasally sound, but hopefully that'll be gone soon enough. Thank you guys so much for watching this long video. I hope you all are getting by well in these crazy times. Stay safe out there, friends, and as always, all ton of volt. I want a warm breeze to ruffle my hair. I want to feel the fragrance of flowers in the air. I want to be inside a dancing crowd. Not at the center of mushroom cloud. We don't need a rocket, we don't need a gun. Drop your rifles on the ground. Peace for everyone. We don't need a rocket, we don't need a gun. Drop your rifles on the ground. Peace for everyone. We don't need a gun, drop your rifles on the ground Peace for everyone